us that indeed tonight our time together um, will help us to understand this particular topic. Um, very relevant at this time. We are in the midst of a global pandemic. And indeed, as we search for solutions to the challenges that we face as a nation, as a world, um, we can't help but see the need for wisdom. Wisdom as we operate, wisdom as we search, wisdom as we, we function, even as believers. And so this idea of spiritual wisdom is very, very relevant to the current situation that we find ourselves in and for us to find ways of applying um, this particular concept. So uh, for me, it's, it's very interesting and I hope that you'll find it um, equally so. So we're gonna talk about this concept of spiritual wisdom and what we find <clears throat> is that over time, uh, people are always trying to create differences between themselves and others. Um, we, we find almost everything to make us look different um, from other people. And we, sometimes it's about race or ethnicity. Um, sometimes it's, we make differences and separate ourselves because of gender. Um, money, uh, rich and poor, um, big job, small job, executive versus a factory floor worker. Sometimes we create differences between us because of our friends and friends who you know, you know, the people that you rub shoulders with, fame or infamous, because a lot of people boast in the infamous persons in their contact list. You know, they know a bad man and they know the Don. And that is where they get their strength from. Sometimes it's, we, the differences are created because of faith. Um, we tend to separate, draw a line and, you know, they're over there and we're over here. It might be power. Who's more powerful than who? Generations is also one of the things that separate people or people used to create differences between each other. Um, young versus old. Experience, whether you have it or not. Um, that sometimes, because you have a little more experience, people tend to show it off a little bit more than they should. Education. Um, education, background, and accomplishments are used to create differences between people. And interestingly, knowledge is one of them too. People who strive to know things so that they can be different. And knowledge, for the purpose of our study, and wisdom uh, go very hand in hand. And I, I want to make sure we, we, we got get that concept. Um, so let's look to a portion of scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, verses 13 and 14. It says, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, Combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. So another translation puts it a little different. If I can bring that up. And it says, um, which things, which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. And verse 14, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. For the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, 
for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Let's look also at Ephesians chapter 5. And we'll read from verse 15 to 17. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Wherefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. So clearly, there are some things that we certainly need to consider about this concept of spiritual wisdom how we walk and i want for you to this particular verse um portion of scripture ephesians 5 verse 15 to 17 we read it and sometimes we read the, the scripture so fast we miss certain things and i i'd like for us to read this each person it's on screen i want for you to read it and meditate upon it it says, be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the, will, what the Lord's will is. If you look at it, we tend to, to, to read over things and go a little fast, but it says, be careful, be. It's a state, it's not an act. Be careful, it's, it's who you are, who you would be defined, be careful. It, it has to be part of you. Be careful then how you live, just focus on how you live, how you live, but not as wise or unwise. So it's a choice. It's a choice if you can live wise or unwise. Then how would we live unwise? Or why would we choose to live unwise? But how you live can be wise or unwise. But as wise doing what? Making this action. It's deliberate. It is you making the most. Now, it is possible that you don't make the most, but as wise, making the most. And then you go on to say, therefore, do not be, we'll come back to that again, do not be foolish. It is possible that as a Christian, you can be foolish. It is just how you are operating, how you are living. And if you can be foolish, you can be wise. It, it sounds very much as, as a choice that you have to make. And that choice comes from what you've been exposed to and the level of obedience that you have to what God is saying to you, what God is saying to us. So when we talk about spiritual wisdom, we realize that there is some action that the believer may very well have to take. It's within their control. And it's how you choose to operate that is going to determine whether that which you do is wise or unwise, or that which you do is foolish or not. The word spiritual uh, comes from the Greek word pneumatikos, pneumatikos. And it always connotes the idea of invisibility and power. Invisibility is it, it's something that you don't see. It's not of this world. It's not of your realm or our realm. It is outside of what we can perceive. It's not of us. So the, when the scriptures use this word, it's communicating this 
out of this world idea, the invisibility, and not just that, but the power. And when you look through scripture, there are certain things that are mentioned or described as spiritual. And I want us to understand this because then it is easy for us to understand why there is a distinction between wisdom and spiritual. So in Ephesians, I'd actually love for some persons to, to, to find these scriptures and we can, we can read a few of them. We'll read all of them. So somebody just pick, pick a verse that's on screen and I'm going to ask you to, to mute yourself or unmute yourself and read for us. I'll take the first one, spiritual host. All right, so Ephesians 6 and verse 12. Talk about the references are the cases where the word pneumatikos is used. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rule of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. There's a, there's, there's a host of wickedness that exists. Describe the spiritual host. Romans 7 and verse 14. Who has that? Things that have their origin in God. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal. Soul, soul on the sin. So there are things that have their origin in God, and those are described as spiritual. So we understand spiritual hosts, we understand things that are spiritual in origin. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 13. Who has that? Which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. So God's purposes revealed by the Holy Spirit is described as spiritual. Um, that we understand, we, we've, we've got that, we've accepted that a long time ago. And um, so you see that particular description there. Galatians 6 and verse 1, this idea of spiritual men. Okay. Brethren, Galatians 6, 1. Brethren, if a man is overtaken by any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a, spiritual, in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself less. Don't be also tempted. Exactly. So spiritual men, ye who are spiritual, Restore such a one. Very good. Spiritual songs. Ephesians 5 verse 19. Ephesians 5 verse 19. Who has that? What about 2 Corinthians 2 15? Go ahead. Okay. Um, verse 15. Um... Okay, for we are to God a fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Exactly. There's a difference between men and those who are spiritual. And the, the scriptures, pneumaticus, describes the spiritual man, spiritual men. Ephesians 5 and verse 19. Speak to the one, speak to one another, psalms, with psalms, hymns and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. Thank you. Spiritual songs. First Peter 2, verse 5. That one speaks of both 6 and 7, spiritual hosts and spiritual sacrifices. Come and like living stones, be yourself, be yourselves built into a spiritual house for a holy priesthood mm -hmm. to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable and pleasing to God through Jesus Christ. 
For those oh, oh, oh. Go ahead. Five. First For five. those it's Oh, I just finished five. I thought it was five and six. No, just five. So okay. the whole company of those who believe in Christ, described as spiritual hosts, and these spiritual sacrifices, and that we understand a long time ago, because we sing the song, we bring sacrifices of praise. But here it is describing that. What about Ephesians 1 and verse 3? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. All spiritual blessings. We, that's actually a verse that most Christians know. Um, so that concept of spiritual blessings is understood by many Christians. What about Romans 1 and verse 11? I long to see you. you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. Or the King James verse say, Version says, make ye may be established spiritual gifts. Thank you. And then the last one here, Colossians 1 and verse 9. Who has that? For this we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Troy. And thank all of you for participating. So here it is, Colossians 1 and verse 9. Since the day we heard about you, we have not Stop praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Wisdom, brothers and sisters, is the practical outworking of knowledge. And that knowledge cannot be separated from spiritual understanding that comes through the discernment given by the Holy Spirit. It's one thing to know, but the application, the practical outworking of knowledge is wisdom. And spiritual wisdom, brothers and sisters, is not, is not a concept that the world easily understands. And it is very important that we as believers understand this because let me tell you why. James chapter 3 and verse 17 tells us, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. The wisdom from above is different from the wisdom honor. It is very clear. Spiritual wisdom, as the Holy Spirit defines it in Colossians 1 and verse 9, is God's way of providing the greatest portion of guidance believers need each day. If spiritual wisdom is God's provision for you in terms of guidance, can you function without spiritual wisdom? Can you function without God's guidance each day? We, you have so many decisions that you need to make, so many issues, and even more so, as you try to balance all the concerns and all the challenges and you know, we, we, we certainly don't know what the future holds and, and we, we, we try our best to make sure that we're not squandering what we have, you know, and, and, and you're, you're trying to navigate on a daily basis. Can you really do without having your daily dose of spiritual wisdom? There are four truths that are revealed in 
1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9. It is clear that believing the gospel of Christ is what makes knowledge of God possible. You can't know God or God's will unless you're a Christian. We've established that. Only Christians can know what God's will is. The second truth is that precise and correct knowledge of God's will is possible. It is possible. We went through a series um, a couple months ago where we, what we, we learned about God's will. It is possible for us as Christians, working and, and functioning and walking each day, to have precise and correct knowledge of what God's will is. That's evident from 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 9. It is also true that precise and correct knowledge of God's will comes because of two things. It comes because of prayer and it comes because of study of the word of God. That's how you're going to know what God's will is. By praying and by studying his word. We're here on a Wednesday night Bible study, studying his word. And we pray not, we, we, we should be living a life of prayer. Yeah? You're driving, you're, you're, you're in the kitchen, you're doing something, you're just constantly praying. That's how you get precise and correct knowledge of God's will. And that is important because number four tells us that the Christian knowledge of God's will is superior to the world's false and speculative knowledge and wisdom. The wisdom that comes from God is superior, brothers and sisters. When God gives you direction, it is superior to what the world will give you. The wisdom of the world is foolishness compared to the wisdom of God. And that is one of the reasons why Christians must want to receive spiritual wisdom. We can't operate without it because God's will is, is embodied in his wisdom that he gives us. It is possible for us to know what God wants us to do. And it is possible for God to direct us in such a way that we would not have even gone down that path. God's wisdom is better than anything you and I can come up with. And that's why it is important for us to notice. And as we try to apply this to our lives, apply his word, God's guidance is very important because we, we face our so many circumstances every day and people try to, to, to use their circumstances to then interpret what God is doing. Some people will say, well, um, from that happening is a sign. And is a sign that I should do this. I should, you know, you're walking on the road and, and, so, and it's a sign. And they use the circumstances to then determine what your actions are or what your next step is. But God's guidance through circumstances, brothers and sisters, never contradicts his guidance from his word. You want me to read that again? God's guidance through circumstances never contradicts his guidance from his word. You know, sometimes, you know, somebody might ask, what is your opinion on, on this particular issue? I say, well, I don't have an opinion, you know, because once the word of God is clear on a particular thing, my opinion is irrelevant. My opinion is irrelevant. I just tell you what the Bible says. It doesn't matter what I think. What the Bible says is what we ought to do. But God's guidance through circumstances is never conflicting with his word. So if whatever it is, is conflict, it's not, it, it's, it's not of God. It means, therefore, that if you think your circumstances dictate that you need to do something that is contrary to Scripture, you are making circumstances your authority instead of Scripture. Does that make sense? If you, if you allow the circumstances, we're talking about as we try to, to, to navigate on a daily basis and apply his word to our lives and, and we're, we're, we're living and we're operating and we're seeking God and, and you come in the circumstances. I mean, some of you are in the circumstances right now and you're, you're reading into the circumstances and using the circumstances to then determine. But if in fact, 
If in fact it's contrary, don't take the money if, it, if you know it's not yours. Yeah? Scripture must govern our understanding of the circumstances in which God places us. Scripture must govern our understanding of the circumstances. So you don't read the circumstances into Scripture. You interpret the circumstances based on Scripture. You see the difference? Don't read it in. Interpret, understand your circumstances based on what Scripture says. God gives wisdom away without reproach or finding fault. We read that in, in, in James, right? I think Turkey even prayed it earlier. He gives away his wisdom without any reproach, without finding fault. He doesn't look at all of our previous foolish choices and decide we are not worthy of receiving wisdom from him. Because you made all these mistakes before, and then, you know, so we're like, I, I, I gave some wisdom the last time, I ain't take it down to foolishness, so I'm not getting no more. No? In fact, people can bring up that. It is, let me see here, James chapter 1 and verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and unbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Anybody have an NIV? Can read the NIV? If any of you lack wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all who find who, without finding fault and with and it will be given to you. Definitely. Now so God will give wisdom away. The God of the universe stands ready and willing to give abundant wisdom to those who ask based only on their trust and confidence in him, not on their track record. You know, we don't deal like that with each other, you know. You see history with people <laughs> make a big difference. And that, that is sometimes is wise too. You know, if somebody has a history of, of um, certain things, you have it in the back of your mind. But in this case, God gives abundant wisdom to those who ask. And it's very important that we understand this concept, brothers and sisters. Very important. Because I want to suggest something to you. God reveals his wisdom to us in his word. But the written word is not the only way God supplies us with wisdom. Other scripture encourages us to seek God's wisdom in wise and godly counselors through observing his creation. But the ultimate source of all wisdom is God himself. The ultimate source of all wisdom is God himself. Let's go back to James chapter 1 and verse 5. Because there is a particular concept here that most times people tend to not realize. It says, any of you lack wisdom, 
Let who? Let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally. Do you recognize this to be a promise? This is a promise. This is a promise. But who is it a promise to? It's a promise to the one who asked. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. We actually tend to misinterpret this particular scripture. And let me ask you this question. Can you ask some wisdom for somebody else? Based on what we just read in James chapter 1 and verse 5. Because, brothers and sisters, there are a list of things that an individual must ask for by him or herself. Nobody can ask for it on your behalf and you receive it. One of them, which we fully establish and we, we, we agree, is forgiveness of your sins. That you and I can ask for, for God to forgive somebody else's sin and that person become saved. No. You remember what, when Jesus was on the cross? What did Jesus say? In Luke chapter 23 and verse 34, this is one reference. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Were those soldiers forgiven? Were those soldiers received into the kingdom? Forgiveness of sin is only received by the individual who himself or herself ask of it if you don't ask for it you don't receive it nobody can ask for it on your behalf and we understand that right the second thing brothers and sisters is faith you can't ask for faith for somebody else faith in jesus christ the individual must ask for it themselves and that's why the the, the enemy seeks to blind the people, blind, yes, blinded their eyes, that they can't see that they, they, their, their, their need for him. You, you and I can't ask for faith for somebody else. I tell you, there's a list of things you can't ask an individual, you can't ask God on somebody else's behalf for. I just want to give you the third one tonight. Wisdom. You can't ask for wisdom for somebody else. And I know this sounds strange because we pray so many times and ask for wisdom for our leaders and, and wisdom for, 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 you know, so many other persons. But wisdom is one of those things that the individual must ask for himself or herself for them to receive it. Spiritual wisdom will only come to the person who asks. Those who trust God ask for wisdom. Asking God for wisdom is evidence that we trust him. There has to be a desire. There has to be a desire by the individual to receive it. Just like there has to be a desire for the individual to receive forgiveness of their sin. If they don't have that desire, they'll never be saved. If the individual does not ask for wisdom, you can pray all you want. If the individual does not ask for wisdom, he'll never receive it. Because those who trust God, those who depend on and trust God, you know, one of the things... Trusting God is like floating. I use it all the time. Not many, they say that 76% um, of Jamaicans can't swim. So maybe y'all can't understand this particular analogy anyway. 
But floating is you just lying there and allow the buoyancy forces of the water to hold you up. You are literally allowing buoyancy to take over. The moment you try to do something else, you start to sink. That's trusting him. That's trusting God. Just, just, just allow him. Trusting God for wisdom is the evidence, or asking God for wisdom is the evidence that we trust him. Solomon. God said to Solomon, because you had this in mind and did not ask for riches, wealth or honor, or the life of those who hate you, nor have you even asked for long life, but have asked for yourself wisdom and knowledge that you may rule my people over whom I have made you king. Solomon asked. He asked, and are you received? Spiritual wisdom, brothers and sisters, is that transaction. Brother Damien, I don't know if he's on. I don't know who else work at the bank. But spiritual wisdom is a deposit to the account of the requester. It is non-transferable and cannot be negotiated on someone else's behalf. There has to be a desire and upon request, the deposit is done without any questioning. You go to the bank and you put in the money and they will ask you no question whatsoever. Well, that will happen in a Jamaican bank, especially if it's over a certain amount. They will ask you, man, walk into the bank with a scandal bag of money. They're not taking it. Where you get the money from? If you can't, if you have a legitimate business, they're not taking the money. They're going to push the man under the counter and press one buzzer and before you know it, some blue and white shirt man come and don't talk so nicely to you. But they hold your hand down with you. But this transaction is so personal. It's like that check that is drawn to somebody else. If there's a check drawn to Kirk Kalash, I can't take that check and go to the bank and deposit it. They're not going to take it. Only Kirk Kalash can encash that. Spiritual wisdom, brothers and sisters, is that transaction. And it means that if you don't ask, if you don't ask, if you and I don't ask for spiritual wisdom for ourselves, we'll never get it. It means, therefore, the question, who should you ask spiritual wisdom for? The answer is yourself. Where does that leave us? Where does that leave you in terms of your own practice? You know, we, we've been doing something else. This is a question that we hopefully we, I don't know if we have a discussion section. But if wisdom is to be requested by the individual, then what should our prayers be for our leaders, these of our country? How should we pray if, in fact, wisdom is something that the individual must ask for? Is the church praying in vain in asking for wisdom for the leaders of our country? That's something that we can discuss. But spiritual wisdom, brothers and sisters, is what is only deposited in the account of the requester. 
We'll stop here and next week we continue looking at the evidence, the outcomes in the life of the believer when spiritual wisdom is applied. Say